Hi. Thank you for joining me again for another edition of Plumline, the Bible teaching show here on WLCF TV and many others around Central Illinois. Thank you for your time, for taking the time to tune in and for being a part of this uh, wonderful medium of Christian television as we hope and pray that you will tell your friends and family so we can get the gospel of Christ, the gospel of, of hope and change throughout this region and around the world before Jesus comes again. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, as we do every, uh, every program, uh, for the most part, uh, we do an uh, amusing little section. Did you know um, little facts there? Some of them useless, some of them make you go, hmm, I didn't know that. So, here are a few of them before we get into our program today, which is uh, we continuing on the, uh, the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus from John chapter 17. Uh, last time um, Jesus was praying for his disciples and uh, we mentioned some of them at the end uh, of the program how they uh, ended up when you know Jesus mentioned that the world hated them as they hated God and then that the world actually um, martyred uh, every single one of them except John. So and now this, this week we finish off the high priestly prayer of Jesus where Jesus switches from praying for his disciples to praying for us. How about that? So before we get into that, let's look at some of our little facts here and um, little trivia. Did you know that the doorbell was invented in 1831? Did you know that the electric shaver was patented on November 6, 1928? The electric shaver was patented on November 6, 1928. I wonder if we were using it back then, if, if uh, you know, it was a little shocking at times because electric razors are kind of tricky to use um, if we don't use them properly. Did you know there are seven points on, this, on the Statue of Liberty's crown? Did you know that the first life saver favor, uh, flavor was peppermint? And it's still my favorite. The first life saver flavor was peppermint. Try saying that 15 times. Uh, nope. Did you know that a typical American eats six, 263 eggs a year? Yeah. Thank God you don't have an egg eating contest like they do a hot dog eating contest in, uh, in New York City every year at 4th of July, where these guys shove down like 60, 70 uh, Nathan's hot dogs. Now, Nathan hot dogs are great. You know, they got them at Sam's Club now around the, around the, the town. So check them out if you have to. I think like two bucks you can get a Nathan hot dog. These guys eat 60 and 70 of those hot dog eating contests. They're crazy. So the average American eats 263 eggs per year. Did you know that the parking meter was invented by a guy named C.C. C. McGee in 1935? Did you know that Jack is the most common name in nursery rhymes? Jack and Jill went up the hill. And then Jack the Beanstalk and that kind of thing. Did you know that the avocado has the most calories of any fruit? The avocado, and it's actually good for you. I love avocado. Um, you can put it in, lip, in uh, frozen shakes. You can uh, body by vice stuff. You can put it uh, in, um, slice them up and put them in, in, your, in your sandwich, you know, your turkey sandwich with your lettuce and your tomato. Oh boy, that's good. Did you know that the first zoo in the USA was in, in Philadelphia? The first zoo in the US was in Philadelphia. Did you know that France has the highest per capita consumption of cheese? France has the highest capacity, the highest per capita consumption of cheese. How about that? Probably all that, you know, that French bread there, the long French bread, it actually goes well with a piece of cheese. And um, since we don't drink, if you, if you have some bread and cheese, the best thing to go with that, hot chocolate, baby, hot chocolate. Big, huge mug of hot chocolate and some bread and cheese. And we could beat the French at their own game, eating cheese. John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for the disciples he prayed to the Father in the first 12 uh, verses here for the disciples, and then he prayed for them specifically and why they should be covered in prayer and by, by the hand and the name of the Father, because the name is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and it, it, it protect, protects the believer. So Jesus prayed that these disciples would be protected and uh, that the world is going to hate him. So now he transitions into, from verse 20 until 26, which is which we're going to we're going to study today, 
20 through 26, to pray for us, those who believe in him though, uh, through the end of time. So let's read it here and see what uh, Jesus is talking about. John 17, verse 20. Jesus said to the Father as he's praying, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the disciples, the last program, but for those who believe in me through their words. So the disciples and the apostles were to take it out to the world. They, these men, these few men, changed the world as we know it for the past 2,000 years. And we know how to change it because we are believers. We have Christian TV today because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have hospitals all around the world because of Christians. We have missionaries because of Christians. We have universities because of Christians. We have women allowed into schools and can drive and have freedom because of Christians, because of Christ. You look at those other societies where women are treated like dirt and all kinds of things, they're pagans. They do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they're not real Christians. So, because of these men, we have his word. That they may, so he's praying now for believers, for us, that we may all be one, even as you, Father, in, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us. So Jesus, can you imagine this? I know it's, you know, maybe it's a child in me, maybe I'm just childish. Maybe I'm not as smart as some of them pinheads, and, sorry, these are professors in university. But I find it incredible and just totally off the wall amazing that little old me, a nobody, am in the eternal God of the universe. I'm, I'm part of his, his family. And you should too. Think about that. You know, just sit back and look up in the sky in the night by yourself. Wow. You, God, know, you know me. You knew me even before I was born. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for making me a part of your family. Thank you for saving me. Jesus said that you, so he's inviting us into his family, that the world may believe that you did send me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one. Now, this Holy Spirit wrote this book through, through John. So we have one member of the Trinity. Jesus is praying to Almighty God, the Father, the second member of the Trinity. And Jesus is the third member of the Trinity. So the glory which you have given me, I give to them. Jesus has given us his glory, his part to be part of his kingdom, that we might be united with him in, his, in, in, in the spirit man as they are one. So we are now part of that Trinity. I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that you did send me and did love them even as thou did love me. Wow. So here, here it is right here. He is saying that because he is in us and we are in the Father and, and Jesus and the Spirit, the world should know that we are Christians. How do they know that? Is it, are we going to show them we're Christians by our lifestyle? What if our lifestyle is not, you know, up to mark? What if we've seen by the water cooler laughing at dirty jokes? Okay, you don't have a water cooler, the coffee machine, or the lunchroom. If somebody's making dirty jokes, somebody's talking about going out after work to, to drink alcohol and, and party in a bar, even if it's a, good, a farewell party for somebody, I recommend you don't go there. And people at work know enough to t don't ask me that to go out with them anymore. Because after 200 times to tell them no, it's like, okay, don't ask them. Is it, be, is it the kind of stuff you got at your desk you're reading? Uh, do you have a copy of the Bible there? Or are you reading Sports Illustrated with a swimsuit uh, edition? Are you part of a gambling pool um, with lottery with the rest of them? Or are you trusting Jesus for, you know, for your provision? That's how the world will know, by your lifestyle. Now, the second part of how the world's going to know is not just by living right. 
because anybody could don't gamble, anybody can not drink, anybody could not watch porno, anybody could not watch uh, anything, um, R-rated movies, or speak dirty jokes. The only the, the way that Jesus says here that the world may know is if we tell them. So we can't lifestyle somebody into heaven. We can't just walk righteously and and they will, oh, I want to be like you, so I go into heaven. How are they going to know if you don't tell them about Jesus? If you don't have a Bible open in front of you on your break time or your lunch hour, you invite them over and say, hey, let me, let me show you something good. And if they say, well, it's, it's all a bunch of do, these and thous, tell them, it's a, that's a King James Bible. This is not. This is New King James. This is ESV. This is NIV. This is New Living Translation. And your favorite translation. Tell them you have it. You have something they can read. Um, when they come by, ask them if they have any peace in, in their heart. If if they if they were to stand before God right now, when they walk out that office door, and a bus hits them, where would they be? And they would say, "Well, heaven." And you ask them, "Well, what are they basing that on?" Oh, I'm a good person. And then you go down to the, you know the story. I, did you do this? Did you obey this command? Did you do this? Um, did you lust after uh, uh, that person? Did you did you ever lie? Did you ever steal a paper clip? Did you ever, and if, yes, yes, yes. Well, they are lying, thieving, adulterer, and they, they have to face God on judgment day, having not kept His commandments and broken every single one of His laws. But if you break one, you break all. They're not going to get into heaven. So then you have an opportunity now. Say, well, you know, Jesus is the only way. I am the tra way, the truth, and the life. John fourteen. Six, and you have that, so that the world may know that you did sent me, and love me, even, and love them. So this, this, all of this comes out of this verse here, verse twenty-three. The, the thing to take from verse twenty-three is God took us into His, His kingdom. He loved us, and now He's saying that the, He wants them that the world may know we are not supposed to keep it to ourselves. And the other thing to learn is we can't lifestyle our way others into heaven. We have to tell them about Jesus. Verse 24 of this prayer. Father, I desire that they also, that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. So now he's praying to the Father, knowing that the Father will say yes, that we who believe in him will be with him in order that they may behold my glory. Woohoo! In order that they may behold my glory, Jesus wants us with him in the kingdom. How cool is that? Which you, and that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you did love me, Father, before the foundation of the world. The Father and the Son were in heaven, and they were just getting along great. And they always did, and they always will. Before the foundation of the earth, the, the Father loved the Son. You know, people doubt who Jesus is. Well, uh, they, they deny He is God. And you know, the Bible does say that um, one day, They will look upon them who, whom they have pierced. He's talking about Israel. And one third of Israel will be saved. But in order for, for people to deny, and some of these rabbis, to deny who Jesus is, they will have to deny this scripture right here. Proverbs chapter 30. And you might hear this later on too. The words of Augur, A-G-U-R, and there's a, there's a teaching somewhere that A-G-U-R, who wrote Proverbs 30, is actually Solomon. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One, like most men. So here's, here's a key verse here. Who ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? Or his son's name? 
Surely you know. Now repeat that. What is his name or his son's name? Tell me if you know. The son was prophesied about a thousand years before he was born. Again. And this is this one more. The foundation of the earth. They talk, and, and Ogre is talking about in this proverb here about all the things that God did before as he created. Jesus said, the Father has loved me, the Son, from the foundation of the earth, and he wants us to have that glory with him and that love with him. O righteous Father, all the world, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. Lord, the Lord is praying to the Father. Wow. And these have known that you did send me. And I made my name known to them. I made thy name known to them. I will make it known that the love where thou didst love me may be in them and I in them. So, he's talking about the future glory. And he's talking about unity. Now, unity is not union. Unity is not union. Um, there's uh, this different association of churches these days. Uh, World Council of Churches, WCC. Uh, there might be a, your local ministerial alliance and so on. They're unions. Uni and, and some of them don't believe the same thing. Um, some of the liberal churches uh, uh, believe in evolution. and They say they believe in creation, but if you believe in evolution, you don't. You can't believe in both. But they believe evolution. They believe in gay so-called marriage. They believe in uh, pro-choice, which is abortion. And these are churches, and they have an association and some of them um, have some conservative churches in them. And in Springfield, there was a split a few years ago because the, the Bible believing churches just split away from them. They want no part of that. That's not what God's talking about here. I will give you an example of what unity is like. Along the coast of Northern California, you know, California has got these redwoods, these massive trees, hundreds and hundreds of years old and beautiful redwood trees. And it, the giant sequoias that they, they call and the, re the red words are noted for age, beauty, and finest wood. I mean, amazing wood. But one unusual characteristic of red words is unity. You never, you never knew that, did you? Here's a did you know right here. Did you know that two red words may grow up together several feet apart? So you got two red words here. Let's say they were a baby at 100 years old. <laughs> two red words here. One here, one here. So you got them about, let's say, several eight feet apart. And after 50 or 100 years, the, the trees begin to touch. So the two baby trees grow up apart, and after and they start growing and growing and growing, and then after about 100 or 200 years, they, they come closer and closer, they start to touch. There are cases where a dozen trees have sprung up from the other roots of a tree that has fallen and formed a perfect circle. A dozen trees. So some of the branches and, and, and the roots break off from those, those two guys right there, and, and they keep going, going out and going out over the years, and then a dozen more trees pop up. And they form a, they form a perfect circle. After several centuries, these trees have grown together so that outwardly they appear to be a single giant tree, when they actually are a bunch of, them, of trees. They're actually 12 or more in a circle. All, all unified together because of these two here that, that are unified over 50 to 100 years and then over, over the centuries they started going together because the roots were kicking up more. In keeping with, with the prayer of Christ, which is um, what, we, what we're doing here, the goal that Christ was talking about, the unity, is kind of like this, where these redwoods would just come together over, over centuries and centuries, and, and we see them now, and they're as big as this room, and massive trees, about hundreds of feet high, and they look like one big trunk when they're actually a bunch of trees unified together. This is what God wants the body of Christ to be like. And this is what it's going to be like in heaven, by the way, because when we get up there, when we get in the presence of God, Christ, for, uh, for a thousand years, and then for eternity, and when God would be teaching us more and more what, what was behind these scriptures and about the great universe he, he has planned and done in the past, 
we, we won't have this doctrine about, okay, um, you speak in tongues, but we, you, we don't speak in tongues. Um, we, uh, we baptize for salvation, and we don't baptize for salvation, which is wrong, by the way. You baptize to show it. You get saved to know it. Um, we take communion once every three months, and you, uh, you taking it every week. We think you're a bunch of Catholics. Uh, so there's stuff like that. We play rock and roll music. You play uh, piano and pipe organ. None of that's going to be happening. It's going to be unity. And so it's unity as God desired it. Now, as, as I said before, unity is not union. A union is a bunch of man-made things put together. Unity is what God puts together. Can any man take that sequoia tree, move them together over the two trees, two baby trees, move them together, and then they touch, and then all of a sudden, 12 more spring up in a circle around it, and they look like one giant massive tree, tree when it's actually one, actually a dozen, sorry. So, world evangelism is, <clears throat> now, to get unity in the church, we must have a basis of doctrine. And the basis of doctrine right here, Jesus Christ, Him crucified, um, died for our sins, we must repent, believe the gospel, and be saved. And then we must grow in sanctification. The military, the British military, has, um, has an awesome structure uh, for military planning. They, they have one of, um, when they go on a campaign, uh, the British military, they have one of, and I think, well, I think most militaries, and the reason why the U.S. military has won so many uh, battles is because they always have an objective. What is your objective? If your objective is to take this land right there, to defeat this enemy, to retake this. And then what is the strategy? You see, you must have an objective, you must have a strategy, and you must have the tactics to achieve that objective. Now, the objective is the goal. The, g the strategy is the procedure, and the tactics are the maneuvers, that w how you're going to execute the plan. World evangelism is the attempt to give every man an opportunity to make an intelligent choice whether to receive or reject Jesus Christ. Jesus said here that the world may know, the world may know in verse 23. That means world evangelism based, let's, let's come we'll cut right to the chase. And how we do that is to know who we are and whose we are. We are therefore in unity if we know that. Unity not just in, uh, with other believers, like-minded believers, but unity with the, with the Trinity of God. We must have an objective. The objective is to make, uh, have people understand who Jesus Christ is so they can make an intelligent choice guided by heart, guided by scriptural knowledge, guided by the Word, so they can have the strategy the procedure to know how to be saved, uh, sins forgiven, trusting and believing, walking, and that these tactics will be how we're going to do it. We have to know how to do that, the world may know. And, and we do that, one of the tactics we should, we should use is prayer, and praying in Jesus' name. Now, now, people say, well, I pray, but I don't need to pray in Jesus' name. No, you don't. If you're not praying in Jesus' name, you don't have, first of all, you don't have the power. And secondly, you'd, if you're disregarding Jesus with, in any way, uh, we question whether you're saved or not. We are told to address all prayer to God the Father, like, like Jesus here did in, in John, cha John chapter 17. And I'll give you some verses you can write down quickly. We are told to pray to the Father in Matthew 6, 9. We are told to pray to the Father in 1 Peter 1.17. 1 Peter 1.17. We are told to pray to the Father in Ephesians 3.14. So, okay, so we pray to the Father. But John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14 says, we can only approach the Father in the name of Jesus. Whoa! You mean I have to pray in the name of Jesus? Yes, you do. 
if you don't pray in the name of Jesus, if you sign papers like your politicians make you do, so you can pray at the meetings, saying not to pray in Jesus' name, you are not a son of him. His, you have denied him before men. Whatever you ask, ask in my name, my name, Jesus' name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So you're glorifying the Father. Remember, it's always about the Father, but you have to go through the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So the commandments is, if you're told to pray to God the Father in Matthew 6, 9, you're told you can only pray to the Father in Jesus' name, John 14, 13 and 14, and all prayer and all Christian activity must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You must have the Holy Spirit. You have to be saved. God does not hear the prayer of an unrighteous man. When Jesus is praying here in John 17 for us, he is talking about his people, those who believe in him. He's not praying for the world. He's praying here for us, those who believe. Ephesians chapter 6, and I'll end with this, tells us we must pray in the Spirit. We, and how to pray in the Spirit? Be saved. Okay, let me get here quickly. Okay, Ephesians 6, 18. With all prayer and, per, and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all saints. Pray in the Spirit. Pray to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Mm -hmm.